And we are coming to you live here at City of the Lord Church. We'd like to thank those that are tuning in with us. Thank you for being with us tonight. Uh, tonight is KGU SOS number 31. We are going to be speaking on the natural elements spoken by the mind of God uh, tonight. So um, I want to let you know on your format, the last page should have an extra page so you can take your notes. A lot of the stuff I say on here, you're not going to find it on your format. So you'll have to write it down. You have to jot down notes as as far as fast as you can, um, because because of the revelation that will come forth. So you'll have to you'll have to jot that down. Okay. So tonight we're going to look at God through the lens of science. Uh, we've been in our biology uh, time, our biology class last uh, couple weeks ago. Uh, we we spoke about the transformation and the concepts of transformation. Uh, but tonight we're going to look through the lens of science, and I will be using some history and a few concepts to reveal the Creator. Amen. So uh, I may repeat myself a couple times, but that's all right. We need to hear it more than once. And so, um, if you want to know and and see what God looks like, in, 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 um, all you have to do is look into infinity. Amen. Because infinity speaks about the beginning and the end, and so even eternity speaks of the Creator. And so I want you to write this down. Science is the art of proving that knowledge is right. Science is the art of proving that knowledge is right. Let me say it again. Science is the art of proving that knowledge is right. Let me say amen. And so uh, uh, we're going to look at the mind or look into the mind of a scientist tonight. Uh, we have uh, an abundance of knowledge, but if we can't prove it, then it becomes a theory. Anytime you cannot prove something, it becomes a theory. So there are a lot of theories in the world. There are theories of death you know, and dying. People have theories of, you know, after you die, this happens and stuff like that. And people have theories of dreams, personalities. Uh, emotions. There's a lot of different theories going on in, in, in our world today. And there, there are theories in every spectrum of life because man cannot fathom what is what is and what is not. Can you say amen? And so uh, in the natural mind becomes a place of reasoning so that man can try to, con they, man cannot comprehend what God is doing sometimes or many times. And so this is why I love the Word of God, because the Word of God is a proven science. Somebody say a proven science. So let's look at a few examples of science accomplishments in the past. I'll give you a few examples, and then we're going to get in the Word. Amen. So uh, Albert Einstein, in 1905, he formulated a formula for the atomic bomb on the eve of World War II. He endorsed a letter to the President Franklin Roosevelt and uh, about developing such a bomb. And so... Uh, you know, he was uh, visiting the United States when Adolf Hitler came to power, and that was in 1933. And being Jewish, he did not go back to Germany. And so he was a professor at Berlin uh, Academy of Sciences. Then he, he later settled in the United States, becoming an American citizen in 1940. Imagine what would have happened uh, if he had gotten the idea, that idea of Hitler would have got that idea from him, amen? And developed the, uh, that, that today. What would what would our world look like today? And so uh, then we look at Jonas Salk. In 1955, a physician developed the first vaccine to kill polio. Uh, that was a great accomplishment. Now, I want to just talk about five of the greatest scientific discoveries and inventions. Uh, number one, DNA. Uh, over the last 60 years, our rapid evolving understanding uh, of DNA has uh, capu capulted, cap catapulted, somebody say catapulted, okay. and uh, medical knowledge and treatments uh, have been transformed in a way that they can solve any, almost any crime just through DNA. And so, uh, so DNA may be the number one scientific uh, discovery of all time. Number two, the internet, possibly the greatest techno technology and invention ever. You know, Jesus said, and greater works shall you do. What was he talking about? He wasn't talking about greater works and miracles because uh, he did the greatest miracles ever. Amen. But he was talking that you will be greater in scope. In other words, you could go on your telephone. You could preach on the other side of the world just, just through the Internet. And he said, man, you don't even have to go into a country. And so and then number three was antibiotics. You know, uh, antibiotics uh, revolutionized the medicine world in the 20th century and uh, with vac vaccinations and 
uh, there's a lot of stuff that, that came forth where they, they healed tuberculosis and a lot of different things. And did you know that um, that uh, um, antibiotics are actually a mold? They, they got that from a mold. And so it's used to treat infections. Then number four, medical imaging. Medical imaging is an essential tool for clinical analysis, allowing doctors to see beyond what is hidden beyond your skin. Amen. Uh, you know, all the diseases that are inside of you. So they have that medical technology. Number five, artificial intelligence. We often look to artificial intelligence uh, from a human perspective. For, for example, like robots, we're seeing robots coming into the perspective and all these things that are taking uh, 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 taking uh, uh, root right now in our world. Can you see, man? So these are just a couple of examples of how the scientific inventions have brought to uh, a societal transformation. And so right now I want to talk about the belief system of science. And so a scientist is trained to believe that if something cannot be observed or measured, it does not exist. How many have ever met somebody that's like a scientist? Well, I don't believe what you're talking about. I really, unless you can prove it to me, right? And so that's how scientists are. I mean, and so here's a powerful scientific discovery, the word infinity. Somebody say infinity. Infinity has actually been measured and it has been discovered that it is a measurement that goes from uh, forever to forever. That's a long time, right? Infinity forever to forever. So science actually can't measure it. They just know it exists. They can't measure infinity. And so I believe God cannot be denied by this because he himself dwells in endlessness. Somebody say God dwells in endlessness. Amen. And so he's infinite. He's forever and ever and ever. And so Revelations 1.8 describes him. He said, I am the Alpha and the Omega. So we say the Alpha and the Omega. Alpha and Omega. He is the beginning and the end, says the Lord thy God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty One. Then in Psalms 91 and 2, it says, Lord, thou has been our dwelling place in all generations before the mountains were brought forth or ever been formed, the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Can you say amen? Now, I want you to tweet this, do something with it, tell somebody about it. Infinity is an observation of God's nature and character. So when we look at of, uh, infinity, we are looking at God's nature. It's just normal to God. Come on, somebody. Amen? And so infinity is an observation of God's nature and character. Let me say it again. Infinity is an observation of God's nature and character. So when man looks at infinity, they're looking at God's nature and character. He's forever and forever and forever. So people that say they don't believe in God, all you have to do is say, hey, look into infinity. It is, it's a picture of who God is. He's from forever, forever and ever. Listen, God didn't leave uh, creation without leaving a mark or an imprint of himself on it. And say, man, there are people out there in the world, you know, if you ever heard somebody uh, once in a while, they'll, they'll say, man, oh, look at how beautiful the mountains are. You know, I can see God's glory in them. Yeah, he left his glory everywhere. And he say, man, he left his glory on everything. There's an imprint of God's glory on everything. So when you look into infinity, you are looking at God's nature and character. In other words, he's forever and forever and forever. If you want to know what God looks like, look right into infinity. Can you say, man? Again, if you want to know and see what God looks like, look at that. And so it is said, if you add or take away anything from infinity, it's still infinity. You can't take or remove anything from it. And so we need to understand that it's a, the eternal place that we hope for one day is that place of infinity. Can you say amen? Now, let's observe the infinite kingdom. Because this is all about God's kingdom. Someone say it's about God's kingdom. Amen. Uh, God's kingdom is infinite. It's from everlasting to everlasting. God's kingdom has no end to it. Can you say amen? See, this is what we're living and, and ready to die for. We're ready to go and enter that place where we're going to live forever eternally. Every man, woman, and child is going to live forever. But the, but the question is, where are you going to live? You, it's up to you to make that choice. Can you say amen? So Psalms 145, 13 says... Your kingdom is what? An everlasting kingdom, and thy dominion endures throughout how many generations? Throughout all the generations. Amen? So his dominion, his kingdom is everlasting 
It is a great kingdom. It's never going to end. Isn't that powerful? Then in Daniel 7, 14, it says, And there was given unto him a dominion and glory and a kingdom that all the nations, all the people in the nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Isn't that, isn't that good news? That his kingdom will never be destroyed. Listen, I got news for you. The devil has nothing on God. Can you say amen? The devil had nothing on God. Listen, the, I'm going to just tell you right now. The devil's not fighting with God. I mean, there's listen, God has no problem with the devil. The devil's not a problem with God. Come on, somebody. Amen? Because he was created by God. How can you fight somebody? Listen, if you were created, God created you, where would you start fighting him at? If he's the one that created you, where where would you throw your first punch? You couldn't. You, there's nothing you can do. The devil has already been defeated. God's not having a problem with the devil. Come on, somebody. He's already defeated the devil. Can you say amen? We're having a problem with the devil. Can you say amen? And and the Bible says, for this reason, Jesus Christ came that he might destroy the works of the devil. So Jesus himself, when he came back, he had already dealt with the devil for us. But if we don't know and understand who we are in Christ, we'll never be able to overcome the devil. We'll never be able to fight. Listen, we'll never, never be able to stand up. The devil has nothing on God, and the devil should have nothing on us. We got too many believers out there believe, uh, blaming the devil for everything when it's our own flesh that is causing the problems. Can you say amen? Now, Luke chapter 1, verse 33, and, it sh and he shall reign. Over the house of Jacob forever, and his king and of his kingdom, there shall be what? No end. Can you say amen? So by the scriptures, we understand his kingdom is infinite, it's eternal, it's from everlasting to everlasting. And this is why Jesus prayed the greatest prayer found in Matthew 16. He said, Let thy kingdom come, let thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So how many know that? When Christ prayed, he prayed that whatever was in heaven, let it be come to the earth. What was that? That was his infinite kingdom. That was his, his, his eternal kingdom. Can you say that? Heaven is eternal. So we say heaven is eternal. The supernatural is infinite. Can you say that? And so his will is that infinity uh, or that infinity or his eternal glory would be experienced on earth as it is experienced in heaven. Can you say that? So we see here that the kingdom of God has no end, and we see that the formula to enter the kingdom comes through, uh, or to enter the uh, uh, eternal realm is through the kingdom. So we say through the kingdom. And by the way, in order to enter the kingdom, you have to become born again. Can you say amen? You have to become born again. Uh, understand this, that we were born through a natural mother and father. But listen, your natural mother and father are not your true DNA. Come on, somebody. Amen. Because when you die, you're not going to go see your natural mother and father. You're going to see the one that created you. Can you say amen? And so understand that. Listen, uh, we, we can, our mother and father, that yes, they were the vehicle that brought us here. But we are going to return back to our creator. Can you say amen? And so uh, uh, we need to understand that God wants us to experience him in eternity, experience him in our now. He wants heaven on earth. Everything that is happening in heaven, he desires it to be on the earth. That's what it was like in the beginning. In the book of Genesis, Adam walked in all that God was. As a matter of fact, Adam looked so much like God that the earth had to obey him. He was made in God's image and likeness. And so when Adam walked on the earth, it was no different than God walking on the earth. This is why God told him to name all the animals of the earth, because he had the intelligence of God's mind in his, in his life. Come on, somebody. His intelligence was great. Because God is in where God's infinite power. He was, he was a, uh, attached to God. And because of that, he was made in his image and likeness. And so he looked just like God. So the church has been hoping and anticipating and waiting around to enter eternity or infinity uh, one day, but God gave the formula to enter it now. See, half of the half of the church is waiting to get go to glory, but there's another half of the church that said we're already in glory. We've already entered the power and the demonstration of what God has given to us. We don't have to wait till we die to experience heaven on earth. Can you say amen? 
And so the kingdom of God is at hand, Mark 1, 15. Jesus said it. It's right at hand. It's right here. The kingdom, everything that you're believing for is available at your hand. That's how close it is. Can you say amen? And so thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. So we are the only generation that is proclaiming it now in our dispensation. Uh, you know, in the Old Testament, uh, the, uh, the uh, ancients declared it was coming. You know, the prophets said there, there's a king coming, there's a king coming, there's a king coming. They declared the kingdom. Daniel declared the kingdom. Amen. In the Old Testament. In the New Testament, they said it's here. It's time to enter into the kingdom. Can you say amen? And so today, our proclamation, it, it is ours. It belongs to us. And we're living it here on earth. Amen. So every one of us. We are adopted into the family of God. When we become born again, we, we, we are born into another family. So we say another family. We, we enter another family, which becomes a royal family. We become a royal seed, a royal heritage, a special generation. Can you say amen? Somebody say, I'm a different generation. Amen? And so we need to understand that we become new. Everything becomes brand new when we enter Christ and we become born again. Amen. Jesus said, unless a man become born again, he can't even perceive that there's a kingdom. He can't even perceive that the kingdom is here. Can you say amen? And so many Christians are, are have their bags packed. They're waiting to go, go home to heaven. But God said, listen, you don't have to wait to go home. You can experience whatever's in heaven on earth right now. You know that in heaven, there's no sickness and disease. He said, you can experience it right here on earth right now. Why? Because in heaven, there's no sickness or disease. There's healing. So we say there's healing. Wherever the kingdom of God is, there's no lack. There's healing. There's deliverance. There's uh, everything that you're anticipating, prosperity, love, everything you can think of that you're waiting for heaven is found in the kingdom. Can you say amen? This is why Jesus worked so hard to get the kingdom back on earth because when Adam had it, he had everything he had need of. It was there. Everything he didn't. There was no lack in Adam. Why? Because he, Jesus, God said, you can eat of all the trees of the garden. Can you say amen? There, everything is. It belongs to you. Everything is for you. And so there was nothing lacking in man. There was no sickness. There was no disease. There was no heartaches. There was no pain. There was no trials. There was no tribulation. There was none of that until he took bite of something that was forbidden. Can you say amen? And so uh, once he did that, the world, what, what happened? God told him, he prophesied. He said, the day you eat of that, you're going to die. And we know that Adam never died. But what was God talking about? He was talking about a spiritual death. Spiritual to death is this, to God is this. It's not being six feet underground. That's not, that's not death to God. To, uh, to God, death is being separated from him for eternity. That's death. Can you say amen? And so God wanted to make it clear to us that we have an understanding that death is not being. Remember when Jesus went to the grave four days. Who, who was in that grave for four days? Lazarus, right? Did you know after the second day they take out all the organs? After the second day, they pull out all the organs of the body. They take everything out. So here's Lazarus on the fourth day. Or the third day, right? He comes and what does he do? He speaks on, on the fourth day. And what does he do? He brings him right out of the tombs. Can you say amen? And so he is the resurrection and the life. And so he brings him out of the tombs. Can you say amen? And so we need to understand that he is our beginning and end. He's the one that has created us. He's the one that, that brings eternity. But death to God is not being underground. Death to God is being separated eternally from him. Can you say amen? Now, let us read Matthew 6.10. It says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So, uh, uh, in other words, uh, let your will be done. Let, let your eternal kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, write this down. God, God wants the earth to experience the eternal because he is infinite. God wants the earth to experience the eternal because he is infinite. He is from everlasting to everlasting, and his intent is to become all in all. Let me say it again. God wants the earth to experience the eternal realm because he is infinite. Somebody say he is infinite. He is from everlasting to 
everlasting, and his intent is to become all in all. Can you say amen? He wants us to experience his eternal or his eternal realm. Can you say amen? He wants us to experience that because that's who he is. Amen? Everything he does, it comes from an eternal perspective. Amen? There's, you know, for, to us, we have 80 years of life on earth, maybe, maybe less, maybe more. But to God, God's looking in the eternal realm. Can you say amen? Nothing ends. It just keeps going. Can you say amen? And so uh, God wants us to experience that eternal realm because that's who he is. And so uh, how many know that the desire and the intent of God, uh, of the creator, is that every person, that he would become all in all. This is his desire. God wants to become all in all. He doesn't want to become second best like I preached yesterday. He, he, he resists to be second best in your life. God will never become second best in our life. He, he resists it. He said, I will not do it. If you want me to be second best in your life, then I'm not going to be a part of your life. I have to be number one. Can you say amen? So his goal is that every person on earth will be, or everything that is on earth, everything that has been created, that he become all in all. Can you say amen? That's his goal. That's his mind. That's what he desires. He wants to become all in everything in your life. Can you say amen? And so 1 Corinthians says right there in 15, 28, And when all things have been subdued unto him, Christ, then shall the Son also himself be subject to him that has put all things under him, of God the Father, that God may become one, all in all. That's his desire right there. He wants to become all in all. Amen. This is why he sent us into all the world, because he wants us to bring every man, woman, and child to experience him. He wants to become all in their life. Can you say amen? Now, Ephesians 4, 4 through 6, there is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above and all and through all and in you all. So that scripture tells us right there that he's in, he's in everything. He's, you know, to be outside of God would be, you wouldn't, you, there's nowhere that God isn't. Let me just say that there's, if God, if God could be limited to not be somewhere, he would not be God. God is in all in all. That's who he is. Amen. You can go to the furthest part of the earth and you'll find God there. You can fly to the moon. You'll find God there. Can you say amen? Because we're in God. Can you say Amen. And even though we're in God, he's also in us. That's powerful. Amen? And so he, he becomes our all in all. Everything that we live for is for him. I mean, we, we, we live today because of him. Now, write this down. We live in him, and, and he lives in us. We live in him, and he lives in us. We live with God, or the God of no beginning or no end. Think about that. The God of no beginning or end lives inside of us. The God of no beginning or end lives inside us, and he lives in us all. He is all in all. We live inside of him. He lives inside of us. Can you say amen? This is what makes us so great. Do you know we are the greatest generation that ever walked the earth? Let me tell you why. Because we're the only generation that are carriers of all that God is. In the Old Testament, they didn't carry God on the inside. In the Old Testament, because of Adam, the Spirit of God would come upon man or upon the prophet. The prophet would speak to the kings. This is the direction you need to go. But then the Spirit of God would lift. Why? Because of the sin in the heart of man. But now after Christ, Christ came and the Spirit came to remain in our hearts, remain in our life. So now we become carriers of all that God is. Listen, you couldn't have more God, more God than you have right now. He's, he's all inside of you. The enemy's plan is to make you think that you only have this much Jesus. Religion's plan is to come and say, you don't have enough Jesus in you. Listen, you couldn't get any more Jesus than you got right now. Because he chose to come and live inside of you. The problem is we have a natural mind that talks us out of what God has already done for us inside. See, see God has done a lot for us. When he baptized us and he filled us with his spirit, he gave us all that he is. He didn't hold back. He, the Bible says that, that he's given us all things pertaining to life and godliness. That's what the scripture says. 
He has given us all things pertaining to life and, 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 and godliness. What does that mean? Everything you need in life, it's been given to you. And everything you need to become godly has already been given to you. There's nothing lacking. When Jesus said it was finished on the cross, there was nothing left over to do. He came and he brought his spirit, which was the empowerment of the kingdom that he came from. He gave us the authority and the power. He gave us everything he was, and he, he deposited it in the heart of man. So we're the only generation that carries all that God is. Can you say amen? The problem is our natural mind talks us out of the things of God. See, when we have a natural mind, oh, I don't believe it. Right? That's what we say. We messed up today. So guess what? Our mind says, God can't use you. Come on. Your natural mind, you're, you're your worst enemy. We are our worst enemy. You, you know them days when you wake up and you're, you feel like trash because you did something wrong? And you're like, man, God can't use me no more. That's you condemning yourself. Your own mind is condemning you. But the Bible said that he made you and complete. Your spirit man is complete. Everything inside of you is whole. It's complete. And so guess what? He made you righteous. He made you his righteousness. It's not our righteousness that makes us right with God. See, when I was in religion, they taught me that the more, the more things you do right, the, the more righteous you become. That's what they taught me. You keep doing it right, brother, and God's going God's to gonna use you. Listen, God doesn't use me because of my righteousness. He uses me because of what Christ did, what Christ did, his righteousness. And as a matter of fact, this is your vehicle. This is not you. So your vehicle leaks oil, it leaks you know, gas, it leaks, you know, we all got these uh, old rides, right? You go and park them in the driveway, there's oil, you know. You know something's wrong with them, right? That's what this is right here. It'll always leak oil. It's always messed up. It's always it's broken, right? But God chose to use the man inside the vehicle, not the vehicle on the outside. Yes, well, this is a carrier of who we are. This is why we need to take care of this because if we don't take care of it, we'll go home early. But this is not who you are. The real you is the spirit inside of the vehicle. You are a spirit. Somebody say, I am a spirit. I am not flesh and blood. I am a spirit man. When they take this away, I guarantee you, you're going to be alive, just like in this room. You're going to be walking around, see, you're going to hear, you're going to sense, you're going to touch everything. Why? Because in the spirit, you have all those senses. And you say amen. And so understand that this is just a vehicle, but we, we want to know the inside of man. We want to know the inside. And so understand your lying, cussing, and cheating, stealing, and, and all that. That's not our sin. That, that just shows that something is broken. And so Christ came to fix that which was broken. The thing that needed to be fixed was our relationship between us and God. We were severed from God because of Adam. And anytime you're severed from God, everything breaks down. Uh, uh, oh, let me just throw it this way. If, God, if we were to walk into eternity right now, nothing would be broken in our body. Why? Because we were complete in him. But it was Adam that sinned. Somebody say Adam sinned. Amen. And by the way, let me just throw this in for free. Adam had, God said you can, you can partake of every tree in the garden. Do you know that we're in this whole mess because of an offering? We're in this whole mess of sin and whatever you want to call it. Because, because one man was so covetous. God said you can eat of all them trees. And he said, but that one right there belongs to me. How many know that every first thing that God creates belongs to him? Are you listening to what I'm saying? You look in the Old Testament, God said, every first male born belongs to me. Everything that, that the first of your increase belongs to me. Everything that is comes first, it belongs to God. And so what happened? It was the first tree that God created. And he said, that belongs to me. But you could have all the other trees. And so what did happen? The enemy comes around and he tempts him to partake of the tree that belonged to God. Amen. That's what that's why this whole mess we're in right now. Now, write this down. We live in him and he lives in us, right? Acts chapter 7, 28. For in him we live, we move, and we have our being. Now, I said all that to get back to science. Christopher Columbus, he had a revelation that the world was round, while many others believed that he was wrong. And they believed he would fall. Uh, he actually, they actually believed that, that they would fall off the edge of the earth, right? 
They, they thought that he would fall off the edge of the earth. And if they sell it, they were just going to go right over the edge, right? There's people today that still believe that the earth is flat. Amen? But do you know that Isaiah the prophet declared it from, through the eternal word? He declared it from way back then. Isaiah did. Watch what it says, amen? Even scientists and men could have, they could have learned from the Bible if they would have just read the Bible, the word of God about the earth. Can you say amen? See, this is what I love about the Bible. God left, he didn't leave anything untouched. Everything that you need to know of is found in the word of God. Everything. Every answer on earth that you need is found right here. Can you say amen? Now, Isaiah 40, 21 through 22 speaks about the contours of the earth. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Look at that, from the beginning. Have you not understood from the foundation of the earth? It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. Look at that. He sits upon the circle of the earth. Man, there it is right there. And the inhabitants thereof as grasshoppers that stretch out of the heavens of the curtain. Amen. So, you know, Galileo never had that revelation. All he had to do was believe God's word. And he would have found out the earth was round. Can you say man? Now, here's another revelation from God's word from the beginning that man missed. It. Exodus 15, 22. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of the shirt. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Mara, they could not drink of the waters of Mara, for they, they were bitter. Somebody say they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Mara. Amen. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And they cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast, cast the tree in the waters, the waters were made sweet, and there was made for them a salute and an ordinance, and there he proved them. Amen. So here we see the water was poisonous, and God told Moses, take a mangrove tree. Somebody say a mangrove. And throw it into the waters. Amen. Then drink. Now, do you know that this is a principle used today for our drinking water? They use the mangrove. Are you hearing me? They use that today uh, in, this, in the same formula. Amen. The same chemical is found in the mangrove tree. They use that same formula to clean water. But the natural man will always deny what the creator has already given as a formula to help man. Understand this. We have a manual that has been given by the creator. This manual right here teaches you everything you need to know about yourself. About what God has done in you. What he's created in you. Because anytime you don't know what you're supposed to do, you'll misuse the purpose that God has designed you. Amen. If you don't know why, what your purpose is, you're going to misuse your purpose. That's why we see people uh, go off into drugs and alcohol and all these things because they don't know their purpose. Because once you know your purpose, guess what? You're not, you're not out there striving, trying to find out what it is. You'll find out that you can design a certain way and there's things that you can do. Can you say amen? And so, uh, you know, it's like Dr. Mal said, the, the most miserable man in the world is a man that doesn't know his purpose. And the greatest day of, uh, of our life is the day we, we were born and the day we found out why. Can you say amen? So we, we need to know our purpose because if we don't know our purpose, we'll misuse our purpose. We'll abuse everything that God called us to be. How many of you ever, have ever bought a television before? Nobody? I guess nobody watches TV. How many in here have ever bought any something, some type of electronic? Maybe a computer. How many in here have ever turned them stuff on and never looked at the instructions? Almost all of us, right? And it takes a minute. It takes a minute to find out, man, I really don't know what's going on here. So what happens? Within that minute that you're using it, you're actually abusing it. Because you're trying to make it do something that you think it's supposed to do. When if the mind of the creator is found in the box, all you have to do is turn around and get the mind of the creator. And you'll find out, find out how high, how wide, how deep, how far it can go. Can you say amen? This is the mind of the creator. God sent his mind to us so that we would understand who we are in Christ. So we would understand why we were created. We weren't created to have a religion or, or to just have a religious day in our time. We weren't created for our own self. We were created for him. Come on, somebody. And so uh, understand that uh, many people believe today that the word is outdated. It's no longer relevant for our time. 
And uh, but the reality is the Bible or the word of God is the answer to every problem on earth. That's the reality. When 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 you get a businessman and he looks at this, he thinks it's foolishness. It's gibberish to him. Why? Because he don't have the spirit of God. Amen. The Bible says that the natural mind is an enmity against God. It's an enemy of God. So anybody that doesn't have the spirit of God is going to laugh at the words of God, of the laugh at the creator. With it. But when you have the spirit of God, he will teach you all things and he'll bring all things to your remembrance and he'll bring and he'll make, give you an understanding of why you were born. What's your purpose? How high, how wide, how deep and how far you can go. Can you say that? See, our problem is this. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That is our sin. Our sin is not our lying, cussing, cheating, stealing, or whatever, adultery. That's not sin. That is the fruit of something that is broken. Amen? But our sin is falling short of his glory. In other words, what you've been designed to do, you're not doing it. So that's your sin. Whatever you've been designed to do, you're not doing it. And that makes us become a, a sinful person. Because God created you to be a, a righteous man, to live in righteousness and holiness, to live with, with, with victory in your life. He created you to be above and not beneath. He, he created you to be the head and not the tail. He created you to prosper in the field and the city. Can you say amen? He created you to be above all the earth. He created you in his likeness, image, and likeness. Can you say amen? He created you just like he is. But our sin is when we don't manifest who he created us to be. Amen. If I take a bird and I tie his wings up, how many know that he's tied up and he can't manifest his glory? This is what the devil does. is He comes and he ties us up so that we cannot manifest the glory of God. Then religion's added to that. And because of that, we cannot open our wings and, and do what God commanded us to do. But Christ came so that we that were in, were in bondage, he set us free so that we can understand that we're more than just a human. We become sons and daughters of God. We become the righteousness of God. We become those that God has chosen for such a time as this. You say that religion will never tell you this. Because they just want you to sit in your chair, give your tithe, and then go home. Make sure your bags are packed. That's what they do. But when you come into the kingdom, it's a whole different story. God comes and says, listen, you're more than that. If you don't believe me, read the story of the prodigal son. The prodigal son is a story of you and I. Did you know that? The older son is the Jewish nation or the Jews. The younger son is the Gentile nation. Come on, somebody. We are the ones that went and spent and lived riotlessly. Come on. We didn't know our inheritance. We didn't even know who God was. And we went and we spent riotlessly. The Bible said that when he came to himself, that's when every one of us came to ourselves and said, man, there's a God. There. I remember my father. He told me this. And we come back to the father. And the Bible said that when he was coming back, his father seen him from afar off. What did he do? He ran up to him and said, you know, good for nothing. Get out of here. He, he, what did he do? He took his best robe and he placed it upon him. You know what that robe stands for? The righteousness of his kingdom. The righteousness of his kingdom. He came, he said, give me your filthy rags. This is what Jesus did for every one of us. He made a covenant with us. He said, give me your filthy rags and you have my righteousness. See, see what religion does, it tries to get to God, but you can't get to God. God has to come to you. That's why Jesus said, I've come to save that which was lost. I came to, to, get, to get that which was lost. He came and he restores us back to kingship. You become the righteousness of God because of his righteousness. So when you stand before the devil, you're not standing in your power and your goodness and your, your, come on, you're standing in his righteousness. You're standing in his glory, not your glory. Can you say amen? And so what happens after that is he gives him the rope of righteousness. And then what does he do? He restores his ring. The ring of authority. The supremacy. You know, without a ring, you can't get nothing done in the kingdom. You have to have the signet so that you can stamp everything that goes in and comes out. Come on. He restores him back to kingship. But he came with the mind of a slave. 
He said, Father, I have sinned against you. He said, I'll be happy just to be a servant in your house. And he said, are you kidding, son? I, you are my son. Religion makes us slaves when we come back to God. But God said, you are not my slave. I paid a great price for you. You are my flesh and blood. Come on. So he restores us back to righteousness. He gives us the ring of the signet. And then he gives us the sandals. And then he kills the fatted calf. And what happened to the older son? He got jealous. He said, man, I've been faithful to you all these years. I've been doing everything right. He said, you know what I'm saying? Your brother was dead, but now he's alive. He was lost, but now he's found. Come on, somebody. That's why the Jewish nation is going to get ang they get angry and jealous because of us, because we're restored unto righteousness because of Christ. You say, man. Understand that the word of God is the answer. There's the, it's the answer to every problem in life. Listen, have you ever heard a Christian say, well, brother, you know, we ain't got all the answers, but someday we'll know. It's right there. Every problem you have in life, you'll find an answer in God's word. Every problem. You know, the nations of the world are fighting right now because they don't know the answers to the problems of the world. All you have to do is look right there. Go to the beginning. Never read a book from the middle. Because if you read the book from the middle, you'll get, you'll get, you'll get, you'll, you'll get, you know, you'll get mixed up. You'll be, I remember when I got saved, it started in Matthew, brethren, so I started in Matthew. I really got mixed up. It's like going and buying that, you know, you go buy this nice book, man. You're like, man, this is a bad book. Everybody told me this book is good. And then you just go to the middle and you read from the middle and you're like, well, what happened over here in the front? See, see, this is the problem. The reason that we lost our identity is because we're reading from the middle. But if you go to the beginning, you'll begin to see the identity of why God created you. Can you say amen? What was the purpose? Why am I alive today? Go back to the beginning. Find out what was in the intent of God's heart and his mind. Find out what he desired from the beginning, and you'll find your purpose. Can you say that? Now, we understand that the word of God has the answer to every problem. Amen? The word and the kingdom hold all the principles of making a perfect environment for man and beast. Now, to change and restore a fallen society, we have to have a prototype, a pattern from heaven so that we can use on earth. How do we make the planet disease-free? By getting our, our ideas and formulas from the word of the kingdom of God. This is how we make a planet that is disease-free and that has fallen uh, short of God's glory. Can you say amen? Now, what is the kingdom formula? Jesus poured out answers in his parables uh, to the social uh, to to bring social transformation and to give us revelation and understanding of how powerful the kingdom of God is. One such example is found in Matthew 13, 33. Watch what it says. The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven or yeast. Somebody say yeast. Which a woman took and she hid three measures of a meal till the whole thing was leavened. Amen. Now the NIV declares the kingdom is like yeast that when you put it into any other element, it's designed to take it over. See, this is what I love about the kingdom. Now, in religion, you have to get guys like this, and you know, you have to get them by the t-shirt, and you have to basically, man, you gotta threaten them to come to the Lord. You better give your life to the Lord, you're gonna die, you're gonna go to hell, right? But not in the kingdom, because when you preach the kingdom, guess what? It's designed to get inside of them, and it's the yeast, it takes over the whole lot. See, that's what I love about the gospel. If you're not preaching the true gospel, it's not going to do that. But when you preach the true gospel, it's designed to get into things and take over those things. This is what Jesus said. Look what he said. The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, like yeast. Which when a woman took it, she hit three measures of meal in it till it is all leaven, till it all overtook. Can you say amen? And so in the natural... Uh, the, the yeast is actually a fungus. So that fungus is only fungus that describes the characteristics and the nature of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, the message of the kingdom is designed to overtake every system that is out there. Think about that. 
Think about religion. It's hard to get people saved, right? Why? Because we're preaching the wrong message. We preach Jesus, but we don't preach what Jesus preached. What did Jesus preach? He preached the kingdom. Come on. That's what his message was. And then when he died and resurrected, he came back and he preached the kingdom. You'll see every disciple preach the kingdom. Can you say amen? He said, go and preach the kingdom. Lay hands on the sick, cast out devils, lay, all these things, right? He said, go and preach the kingdom. And so the kingdom message is that fungus. It describes the characteristics and the nature of God's kingdom. So when we understand the kingdom from a biological position, we can begin to understand the fullness of the kingdom and the power that it has. See, I love it, man, because Jesus, you know, he went about and all he did was throw seed like that. Guess what? And it produces. What do we do today? We, we, man, we have to be on people 24-7, uh, you know. We have to be on them 24-7, man. If they're not serving the, you know, we, oh, they're falling away, so we got to be on them like a ton of bricks and chasing after them, trying to get them saved or keep them safe. Or, how many know what I'm talking about? But the kingdom, when you give them the kingdom, they go away and they come back and they're full of it now. I had a young man that came to our church. He was my spiritual son came here. And I'll never forget, I had a men's meeting that day and I preached the kingdom. And he had, you know, that, that was the first time that he had ever heard it. I didn't know this. But he left, went away. Six months later, he was knocking on the front door. And he, and he says, Apostle, he says, I've, I've been trying to get back here for, for all these months. I've been trying to get back here. He said, I can't get rid of this message. It's stuck inside of me. I said, that's the kingdom. Come on, somebody. The kingdom is so powerful that Paul never even walked with Jesus. But when, when he, listen, when Jesus came to him and gave him the gospel, he actually spoke to, to Paul and he re revealed himself to Paul. Paul didn't even have to go to the other apostles. Why? Because he had the message of the kingdom right there. Can you say amen? Now, here's another uh, formula. Matthew 13, 31. Another parable put forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and he sold in a field, and, and it is, it's the least of all the seeds. But when it grows up, it is the greatest among the herbs, and it becomes a tree so big that the birds of the air come and they lodge in the branches thereof. So the kingdom of God is compared to a seed, which is the least of all the seeds, the smallest in stature, no significance, but it became the largest of all other trees and all the birds of the air came to lodge in it. Amen. This is talking about the eternal formula that increases its capacity at an alarming rate. Amen. God said the keynote message is like a seed that you can. How many have ever seen a mustard seed? It's so small you can't even see it. But yet, guess what? The Bible says that it becomes so big it's the largest tree in the land. And all the birds, somebody say people, they come to lodge in it. Can you say amen? Now, the pearl of great price, Matthew 13, 35. I'm going to hurry up. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking godly pearls, goodly pearls. What, uh, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, he went and he sold all that he had and he bought it. And so the parable, the pearl, teaches us how to take on the parasite. It is the picture of us and how we are transformed. When we look at when we look at this uh, this uh, thing, that parable that Jesus is talking about, he's talking about us. We are like that parasite. Come on, somebody. We are like that pearl of great price that God is trying to develop. Can you say amen? And so it is a picture of us and how we are transformed. The result is we will make pearls when we understand the process. Every one of us have a process. And if you allow that agitation in your life, you will become valuable. Come on, somebody. I mean, no, you listen, you ain't got a testimony until you've been through the test. Can you say amen? And so what is the process of the pearl? A parasite enters the womb or the living quarters of the oyster. This is how a pearl is developed. Usually it is a grain of sand and it, and it agitates the, the, the oyster, amen? And so when it enters into the living quarters of the oyster, it finds the right position and environment to agitate the oyster. Amen? Write this down or tweet it. It, it's literally impossible to understand the kingdom of God without irritation. It's literally impossible to understand the kingdom of God without irritation. Again, it's impossible to understand the kingdom of God without irritation. In other words, 
When you start hearing the kingdom of God, you're going to be irritated because the irritation produces the pearl of great price. Amen? God allows us to be irritated by parasites to produce a priceless pearl in our lives. So the things you are trying to get rid of are the very things that you need to embrace because it's going to produce a priceless pearl in you. Amen? Uh, my bishop used to always say this, and this is off the record, okay? Please don't go tell people oh, he's in a cult or he's doing this or that. But this is my bishop, and my bishop came. He wasn't a regular bishop. This man was from, I'm telling you, this guy had so much revelation. But he would always tell us, embrace that which you don't want to do because it's going to chase you straight to God's hands. Isn't that powerful? And so, uh, uh, you know, it could be a pay, uh, uh, our parasite could be the place of employment. How many ever got a job, man? The guy that's working there, man, all he does is agitate you. Lord. Huh? You, you know, I was on a job one time. I said, Lord, I want to learn how to love like you. Don't ever ask him that. Because he gave me a boss that hated Christians. And man, he would, man, he'd get in my face and, Man, talking about testing, you know, he get in my face. I wanted to punch him. I wanted to, you know, he get in my face. He spit in my face because he'd be yelling at me. And he would promote all the other men, but he wouldn't promote me. And I, there I was crying. Uh, God, why are you promoting? I'm faithful here. I'm, you know, I'll do all this stuff. And these guys going above me. They're doing all these things. And God said, you said you want to learn how to love like I love. So you know what he did? He said, you're going to have to start to learn how to pray for those that are against you. So my first prayer was, God, get rid of them. Get, you know, get, you know, send your, dad, your angels to take them over. You know, that, that's what my prayer was for the longest time. And God said, you're not praying right. So God, I said, I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? He says, you got to love them. you got to pray for them. And man, I would pray, I would pray those prayers that I didn't want to pray. You know, the kind that you gnash in your teeth. I really didn't want him to be blessed, but but then the day came, I kept doing it. The day came to where finally I got to the point that I began to see him through God's eyes, not my eyes. And I began to really pray for him. And uh, you know the rest of the story. I, I, w- I was, you know, this guy would get me in trouble for anything. He would yell at me, demote me, all that stuff. And I was, all, I was, I was between jobs one day. I worked at construction field for those that didn't know. And I was between jobs. I used to run a, a crane. And so um, I was between jobs, and I didn't have a lunch that day. So I pulled over uh, on the side road, and I was supposed to be at the next job site. I pulled over and I said, man, I got to get some because I'm ready to faint. And, you know, I, I got some food and I ran out outside the truck, got in the truck, man. And I was just about to open the package and the radio went off. He says, where are you at? I was like, oh, man. I said, what am I going to do now? And you know what my flesh had said? Lie to him. Telling me that you're over there somewhere. And man, something inside me, a small voice said, tell him the truth. So, man, I, I told him the truth. I said, I'm, I'm going to just tell you the truth. I said, I'm sitting right now in front of 7-Eleven. I had to get a sandwich because I was ready to faint. I said, and I started telling him. He says, and all of a sudden he says, the radio went off. And I said, oh, man, he's mad. Next thing, he pulls right next to me. He said, good. He said, because I was watching you. And he took off. Wow. And you want to know something? The net, the, there was a time that I was on the job and something went wrong. There was thousands of dollars lost on the construction field, and the and the and the main guy, one of the one of the contractors, blamed me for it. He said he did it because they wanted to get the, the the crane for free and all this stuff, right? So so here comes my boss, man. He comes in the gate and the, there's there's dust coming through the truck and everything, man. He's flying over. I'm like, oh man, I'm going to get fired today. So he comes, man, and he says in the trailer. So we go in the trailer and all the, the contractors are there and stuff. And man, they're, they're yelling. They're yelling at the top of their lungs. And, and, and my boss stands up there. He did what? And they, and they are talking. I'm like, this is my last day on earth, I guess. You know, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> you know what happened? Oh, this is the truth. You know what he said? He came up to me. He said, did you do that? I said, no. That's not the way it went down. And I told him exactly what happened. And he went over to the contract and he says, you're a liar. Told him just like that. He said, you're a liar. He said, because I know this guy won't lie. Come on, somebody. See, sometimes God wants us to, even in the place of employment, there's parasites. 
that are going to design to to bring God's love back in our heart. But what do we think of them? Oh, this is messed up. Man. You know, he's trying to teach you God's love. Can you say that? How about in relationships? You have nobody's ever had bad relationships here, but over in the other cities, people have bad relationships. What about bad relationships? Those are parasites. To learn how to love, to learn how to, to, to have a good relationship with people. You know, before I came into this thing, I didn't like, I was a, uh, not a, 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 I was an introvert. You know, I was uh, one that just hung around myself, me, myself, and I. You know what I'm talking about? I get along with life just by myself. And so guess what? God put me in a place where I had to be around people. Oh, I was weird. It started stretching me. How about un un uncomfortable situations, amen? People living with you for whatever circumstances, amen? We don't know why, but all of a sudden now our hair is, is standing up every, every day in our house, amen? Because somebody's living with us. How about unforgiven obstacles? Those, these are all parasites, un unforgiven obstacles. <laughs> How many in here have ever had unforgiveness? All the time, right? We, we, every day we have the option to become bitter or better. So you come into a relationship. I know that Vato, I know that dude. You should have seen what he did to me. Yeah, I did too. You know, I had some friends, man, that I had to see them face to face. My worst enemies became my best friends. I'm telling you the truth. My worst enemies became my best friends. Yeah, that's hard to believe, right? And so, write this down. God allows us to have toxic agitation to produce a pearl of great price in us. God allows us to have toxic, toxic agitation to produce a pearl of great price in us. This is the whole philosophy of, of, of the oyster. Is that if you get an oyster and you place it in a in a place, it's designed to overtake that place. It's designed to take on the burden of that place. Uh, I'm going to share something with you in a minute. But God allows us to have the toxic agitation to produce a pearl of great prices. See, without a pearl, people won't listen to you. Come on, somebody. I know people go get ordained, and, and you know they can't even buy an appointment. They go get their their, their 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 you know education, or they go to Bible cemetery. I mean seminary. They they go get they get all educated, right? But they can't even buy a, a meeting. Why? Because there's no pearl. And by the way, let me throw this in for free. When the trees don't eat of you, it's because your fruit is rotten. Let me say that again. If the birds don't come and eat of you, it's because your fruit is rotten. You gotta have listen. I want some good fruit. I want all them birds in my nest. Let's come. come on, somebody. Amen. You know, I, I was born on the east side, over on the other side of the tracks, man. And you know, we had this old mulberry tree. And man, how many know what I mean by mulberries? Man, you know what I'm talking about, man. When they when they were everything was purple, man, and for blocks. You know, you could see our footprints for blocks, man, because we were under the tree. But man, it never failed. There was billions of birds. Here they come again. Oh man, it was like you know that movie, The Birds. Here they come. You know, they were eating from the tree. Why? Because there's fruit. <laughs> Amen. When you have good fruit, people want to eat what you got. I gotta have that. Come on. Now, what's the model of prayer for toxic environment? John 17, 14, 15. I, this this is the model prayer that Jesus gave us. I have given them thy word, and the world hates them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou should take them out of the world, but thou shalt leave them right where they're at. Keep them from the evil. Jesus said, listen, you don't have to quit your job because the guy you work with keeps cussing, lying, cheating, and stealing. Just stay right there. That's why I put you there. Can you say Amen. What did Jesus say? Father, I pray you leave them right in the mess they're in. He didn't say, I pray you rapture them out of here. Get them out of here, Lord. Because poor things, you know, I don't want them to go through nothing. He said, leave them right there. Just keep them from the evil. That was the Lord's model. That's the word for us. This is the word that religious people hate. They want to get out of here. They got their bags packed. They just want to escape the earth. 
But the Bible said that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness of thereof. The Bible said that the earth has been given to the sons of men. The heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to the sons of men. In other words, he has no intentions of surrendering the earth over to a fallen angel. Come on, somebody. He's coming back, but he's coming back to reign. Rule and reign. Come on. Jesus said, if you're going to live a godly life, you're going to suffer persecution. He didn't say, if you live a godly life, you're going to, I'm going to take you out of here. You won't have to. Nothing's going to happen to you, man. You're going to be all right. It's going to be okay. Imagine the 12. They thought they were going to, they were going to escape all the problems. The 12 disciples thought, ooh, man, we got it made now. We got the master of the universe with this. But guess what? He said, I'm going to be away from you for a time. He said, but I'm not going to leave you comfortless. In other words, you're going to have to stay here. Come on, somebody. See, this is our whole purpose. God is raising up his sons right now on the earth to take back what the enemy stole. That this, right now, what we're living right now, there's a take back in process. Everything that the devil stolen, the church is taking it back. The people, the men of God and the women of God are taking it back and they're possessing what God belongs to God. Come on, sir. Jesus said, it. You, don't, you don't have to stay away from people because you don't like them. Stay right there. That's why I put you there. Amen? With, with no other Christians around. Well, I want to give me a job where there's Christians. Forget about it. You're supposed to be the light of the world. And you know what? You'll never know if you're light until you're in the dark. You'll never know it. It's easy to be in the light with other people in the light. But when God puts you in a dark place, man, and you're the only light there, come on. You know, I was on the job. I was in a factory. Years ago, I was in a factory, man, and the guys knew who I was. They knew. That, as a matter of fact, there was a brujo that worked on my on, on my crew. He would come up to me, cantations, and man, he'd bring feathers and uh, chicken feed, all these things, man. He said, you're going to die early. He would come out, all this stuff. He hated me because I was the light of the world. I would tell him about Jesus. I'd tell him the good news. I wouldn't tell him he was going to hell. And that, that, that one day came, man, these guys would watch my life all the time. And the, the lady that would come over there to sell burritos, man, guess what? She said, tell, tell Mitch, I want, I want to do something with him. I want to be with him. So, you know, all them guys watched my life. And I was standing there. I said, you know what, man? I said, I feared the Lord more than I feared what you guys are doing right here. I said, you know what? I chose to, to live in the light as he is in the light. And you know how many guys got saved because of that? I was living in a dark employment area. Are you know what I'm saying? Nobody was saved. You know how many guys got saved out of that because of that? God will put you in darkness because you're the light. Oh, you're going to get tempted. You're going to get tempted real good. But I guarantee you, if you stand your ground, you're going to see the glory of that. Come on, sir. Understand this, religion leaves the process of producing a pearl of great price. People that are in religion, they don't like the process. Because people who are in religion are afraid of becoming dirty, unclean. They are more afraid of the world than rather than the world them. You ever seen them before? Oh man, there's a guy with a tattoo on his nose. Or there's a guy that has a, a pentagram. Stay away from him. It's evil. Who, listen, what kind of spirit do you carry? What kind of spirit are you carrying? You're supposed to be the overcomer, the light of the world. You're supposed to have all that God is on the inside of you. What, what, what does a tattoo have to do with anything? It doesn't change who you are, the son or daughter of God. Come on, somebody. See, there's so, some people that are so uh, uh, evil conscious. They're no good, heavenly good. So they stay away from the environment they have been sent to to clean out. And so the way we know we're stuck in religion is because we're always trying to stay out of the muddy waters. But do you know that one oyster, so we say one oyster, if you put them in 50 gallons of water, of muddy water, it will filter and purify in the process in just a few days, the water will become clean. Did you know that? The oyster is designed to filter dirty water. 
And in the process, it produces a pearl that's worth millions. Isn't that something? That's how we are. We're like a pearl of great price. God put us right in the mud. Leave them right where they're at, Father. I pray that you leave them right there, but don't let them partake of the evil. Isn't that awesome? Imagine if God puts you in a world full of dirt and an environment full of sin and toxins. That's what he did. The kingdom of God is like a pearl of great price that when a man has found it, he will sell everything else to possess that pearl. You've been designed to overtake the world. See, but this is the problem. We get saved and then the what we go to save, it begins to change us. What we go to change begins to change us. This is where idolatry starts. What we go to change, the thing that we've been sent to change, changes us. That's idolatry. When we go to change it, are you hearing what I'm saying? But see, we've been designed... The Bible said, if you have the kingdom of God in you, you're designed to overtake any system you put in. Man, you'd be at a rave and all of a sudden the ravers are dancing unto God. <laughs> because you've been designed to overtake the system. Oh yeah, look at it in the word of God. You see these guys, man, the, the 12, everywhere Paul put his foot, there was a riot. All hell broke loose when Paul stepped in the city. You know what I love about Paul? Paul went in a city and they, man, they got so mad. They were gnashing their teeth. They took that guy and they dragged him out of the city, out of Pueblo. They took him over there to, to Goat Hill, man, and they, and they stoned him. They stoned Paul. And the Bible said that he got back up and he shook it off. And he ran over there to the south side. No, you know what he did? He ran back into town. Come on, somebody. We're designed to change the environment. See, what we do today, we allow the world to change us. We, we take the methods of a Babylonian system because we don't think we can minister or we have the word for the people today. So we, have, we adopt their system to try to reach others. That tells me you ain't got no power. Because when you have power, the spirit of God is designed to change. I've had people come in here, man. I'm talking, they, they were cold, stone cold. And the spirit of God hit them. And they were changed in a minute, in a twinkling of an eye. Where no other system could change them. Come on, somebody. So we are carriers of all that God is on the inside. We cannot deny that. And when we start operating like this, I'm going to tell you, we're going to see the power of God. Let's give him a praise. I want to thank those that are tuning in and are watching live tonight. Thank you for being with us. I ask you to sow seed. It's right there on your screen. If you sow seed, God will bless you. We love you. God bless you. I hope to see you next week. Amen and amen. How many got something out of that this morning? Yeah. Yeah.